Let's open in prayer if we can. Lord, thank you that we can pause, that we can stop, that we can listen, and that we can come before you knowing that you hear, knowing that you know every need, knowing that you have all things in the palm of your hand. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, this night that uh, the ears of all of us would be opened in a new and a fresh way. I pray that your spirit would help us to understand, even as you said that you would send back the spirit the comforter to teach us all things lord we need instruction we need more we need to be equipped and able to be able to overcome in this life and to be able to minister to others your love and i pray lord help us to make help us to be worthy instruments of your love and i pray this in the name mighty name of jesus christ amen amen, amen. amen. Um, a couple of announcements here before we get started uh, this weekend is the end of daylight saving time which means you gain an extra hour of sleep because we fall back or okay. an extra hour to stay up. <laughs> <laughs> or an extra hour to stay up, yes. <laughs> or just not worry about the time and let it happen, okay? But do remember that because uh, Sunday will be on a different uh, time schedule. Uh, you'll be either late or early, depending on what you set your clock at, okay? <laughs> But I will guarantee you, you won't want to miss this Sunday. Invite a friend because we are going to have a pancake breakfast, okay? Now, purpose of that is to enjoy bacon and pancakes and lots of good, good food, all right? But it's to fellowship around the table, okay? Sometimes there's as much ministry that can be done when you can fellowship one-on-one -on -one with another person at the table or just walk around and visit with people this usually draws in um, a lot of people that sometimes we haven't seen for a while so let's be prepared and uh, let's have fun we are going to have be doing some uh, pancakes of all sorts, uh, but there is a sign-up form if you are tech-savvy to go online, and it was on my Monday email. If you're not on the email list, uh, let me know and I can add you to that. The sign-up form just allows you to go in and designate who you are and to um, put on there what you can possibly bring or that you'd be willing to volunteer to do um, i'm on there to to set up the tables uh, before uh the 10 o'clock start time and uh, that means i'll be here probably about 8 30 to get all of that uh set up i'm also on the cleanup detail so i'll be putting away the tables but that's where i'll i put myself on that sign up form if you don't like to go online and put that information or you know tinker around with it um, just let patty know and uh, she can put it down on the list okay but we will need to have some some uh, efforts made to bring some egg dishes uh, meats and stuff we'll be providing all the pancakes okay it'll be a fun time looking forward to it but like i said it'll have the ministry itself will be good we'll have some uh, some worship in fact we might we might have some worship okay one of our worship leaders just came in so 
for the pancake breakfast we're talking about. Be nice to have a, a song or two. We'll see what happens, okay? If not, we'll put it up on the, the uh, Spotify. Okay, well, this is a final wrap-up session of some studies that we've been doing on a book written by Steve and Sally Wilson. There is, uh, you know, some more copies that are available uh, that you can purchase for $8.99. Um, but it's a short, very intimate book that we've really gotten a lot out of. It's called The Gifts, The Fruits, and The Sound of Effective Ministry. What it's talking about is the gifts of the Spirit as we read about them in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, nine of them, and the corresponding gifts, fruits, that is, of the Spirit, nine fruits of the Spirit, and how they work together, but they back up the gifts of the Spirit, okay? I'm going to get into it tonight here in the actual part that we'll be covering is the last two chapters of this book here. Again, it's an excellent read. It's been an excellent source to be able to help us, help us individually in our Christian walk to equip us with more understanding of the gifts of the Spirit that God has given to all men. Okay, we'll get into that and again summarize that to, to everyone tonight. But the gifts of the Spirit that were provided for every born-again believer. Okay, and what has to back up those gifts are the fruits of the Spirit in order to make it effective ministry. Make sense? Okay, so these two final chapters are going to speak to us about being like Jesus. Okay, sounds good to me. They'll speak to us about faith and love. Those are the two main things that we'll talk about it, but more importantly, having the compassion that uh, behind that love that will activate our faith. So again, we're going to talk tonight about faith and love, okay? Some deep subjects all of their own, but nail down what it happens, what happens when compassion comes in to activate that faith. You know, love, we hear it, you know, all the time. Uh, it's the most, you know, excellent grace that glorifies God, okay? When we think about uh, doing good deeds uh, or using God's gifts, it's, it's easy to focus on the action. Okay, it's, it's real easy to, to focus on serving or giving or helping in some way, but scripture reminds us that the why behind our actions is more important than the what. Does that make sense? Okay, the why behind our actions. Why are you doing that? Do you really, really have you stopped to think about that? But that is more important than the what? Even the most impressive deeds, whether giving everything we have to the poor, okay? Or using our spiritual gifts. It means nothing if they're not done with love, okay? Love has to be the motivation behind everything we do because love reflects the heart of God. Okay? When we serve out of love, we're not just fulfilling a duty. We're pointing people to Jesus. Our deeds, when they're rooted in love, carry really eternal value. Okay? So ask God to help you check your heart let love be your guide 
in how you serve others, how you use your gifts, and how you live out your faith. The grace of love is really the difference that I'm talking about here. The more excellent way shows you the way to the Lord's heart. And we'll have a verse here that you're familiar with that says those things. But when it comes to serving others and using your spiritual gifts, love isn't just a warm, fuzzy, nice idea. Okay? It's the core of why you do what you do. Come on. Yeah. Without love, your actions lose their appeal. It's kind of like what we talked about at the beginning, that the gifts of the Spirit can be given to mankind, to brothers and sisters, but if there's not character, fruit behind it, nobody really cares. You can be the greatest, you know, preacher, you can be healing people and everything like that, but if your life behind you stinks, nobody really cares what you're doing. Okay? I hope you get what I'm, what I'm saying here. Love reminds us to focus on people, not tasks. Okay? It's, it's real easy to get caught up in doing things to check them off the list, you know, that, well, I visited so-and-so in the hospital, or I did this here. Great, but why are you doing what you're doing? Stop and think about it. Love compels you to, to see the people that you're serving, yeah? It's not about doing a good deed, it's about caring for someone's heart. Love grows your patience. Whether teaching, encouraging, or leading, love reminds you to be patient with others just as God is patient with you. Spiritual growth, that's what we're talking about in these Wednesday night studies. Spiritual growth takes time. And love keeps you steady. Love will nurture humility. You do not serve to get attention or praise. Amen? Amen. Yeah, from the Lord, yes. That, that praise can come to you. But when love motivates you, you serve quietly, knowing it's about honoring God and helping others. Lean into being loved by the Lord, and you'll be ready to be led and motivated by love here. In his book, Steve writes, God values gifts incredibly. He gave us the gifts so we could give them to others. However, we're living in a season where God is bringing his fruit to the forefront. And he's requiring that the sound of the gifts he gives to be tempered with the sound of that fruit. Again, same thing that we we're talking about in the beginning. The gifts have been given. God has given to each man as he will. They're there. But the fruits behind it have got to be matured. They have got to be present with those gifts here. Beyond wanting to do what Jesus did, which I know every one of us would answer a question, a resounding yes. Would you like to do what Jesus did? Okay. Yeah, I would. But beyond that, okay, we want to do what he did as he did it. Okay? That could be a difference. In the first few chapters of this book, we talked about the development of the nine fruits of the Spirit that are essential in order to back up the nine gifts of the Spirit as they're identified in the first 11 verses found in 1 Corinthians 12. If you've got a Bible, you can open it up here, but I'll read it to you. 1 Corinthians 12, 
It says, now concerning spiritual gifts. Paul is writing this to the church at Corinth. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Okay? I don't want you to be unaware. Okay? He's making it a point. You got to know about these things. I don't want you to be ignorant. So he goes on and he says, to each one of you, verse 7, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to just the pastors? No. All for the common good. For who? Everybody. Okay? All right. For to one, I'm, I'm just reading the word here. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit, a word of wisdom. And to another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Again, these are gifts given to everyone. Okay? And to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the discerning or distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. Okay? Some of you may have not heard about these gifts. Or it's just not ever been a part of even a, 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 a part of the you know religious upbringing or anything like that. But most of us have. A lot of us, again, have studied to understand that this is what God gave to every man, okay? For what reason? Verse 11 says, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills, okay? God gives these things so that it can profit with all. That means that everybody can be uh, benefited with these gifts. So you say, well, I, I don't have the gifts of miracles. Okay. I, I understand. But what I want us to get is it's in God's word. If it's in God's word and it says that he has given these gifts to all men, then we should be pushing into, I want to be exercising all of these gifts of the Spirit. Now these gifts, and we'll get into, uh, you know, more at the end here, if there's questions about, you know, what, what are the meanings of all of these gifts here, but these gifts have to be supported, developed, by the nine fruits of the Spirit. We find this in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Listen to what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit. We know this. It's a memory verse, I'm sure a life verse for many of us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is patience, gentleness, which is kindness, goodness, faith, or faithfulness, meekness, temperance, which is self-control. Against such there is no law. Against such, against these nine fruits that we just listed of the Spirit of God, there is no law. There is nothing at all that is going to stop or prevent what Jesus paid for so that we could have these fruits of the Spirit. And every one of those fruits of the Spirit is what we need to nurture, develop, 
and they've got to support the gifts of the Spirit here. Quoting again from Steve's book, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to do what Jesus did, and through the fruit of the Spirit, we learn to behave like Jesus behaved. Let me read that again, because it really nails what this whole book is about, okay? Through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to do what Jesus did. Through the fruit of the Spirit, we learn to behave. Behave like Jesus did, okay? like he behaved. Steve's book uh, helps us to understand that the gift is what the Holy Spirit gives us to release into others, okay? The gifts of the Spirit is what God gave to us, Jesus gave to us to release into others, while the fruit or the character is the vehicle through which the gift is delivered okay let me give you an example here because it's important to to get this okay if i was exercising the gift of a word of knowledge okay which is something that the spirit will give to you of a word that the lord will speak to you yes we can hear his voice, amen, okay? The word of knowledge is a gift that the Lord would speak to you to help someone or to give a word to some someone. A word of wisdom oftentimes is incorporated with that. That fruit of the spirit of uh, kindness or gentleness um, or just of love, okay, will help me to release that word into that person. If it's all about me and I'm just saying, hey, I've got a word for you, you know. But if I come to that person and say, you know what, <laughs> and I'm going to pick on Mike here, okay, because I know I can. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I could come up to Mike and I, I could say, Mike, tell you what, the Lord is just putting on my heart that he has something for you. He, he has a word to speak to you. It's an encouraging word uh, for you, Mike would say. Okay, well, let me hear it. And I would pour out to Mike that, you know, the, whatever the Lord has given to me that you know the lord showed me that you know his compassion on you and his love for you is so great because he knows what you've been through and you know just making up stuff here okay that love and that kindness and that gentleness the fruits of the spirit will help release that gift of the spirit that i'm delivering that I'm exercising. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now take it on another note. Okay. Mike, I've got a word from you. I'm telling you what, if you don't shape up and make things right here, I'm, you are going to hell, man. Okay. Or you see, again, it's a total, you know, back office, like Mike would say, mm, I'm out of here. Okay. There's fruit, there's character that has got to flow behind the gifts of the Spirit. I don't know if that made any sense or not, but it's, it's important that we get uh, those things here. It takes both. Because when the fruit and the gift work together, the kingdom of God advances. Okay? Did you hear me? Okay? If it's done by the Spirit as it should be, 
with the fruits of the spirit behind it, there can be kingdom work. There can be a work developed in like that first example to Mike that he just melts and he feels the presence of the Lord in it. It softens him and he, he gets to understand and feels a, a presence of the Lord that he's never felt before. Okay? You see what I'm saying? If it's delivered with the fruits behind it. Amen? Amen. Steve also writes, correct use of the gifts with character or fruit in place draws people toward relationship with Jesus. That's a good thing. Gifts then draw people to his goodness. It's all about the kingdom. It's about why are these gifts given to men? Why are these things present? Okay, why are the fruits of the Spirit even important? Why does it matter? Okay, because God's kingdom matters. We want to make sure we, as Christians, can disciple others. Okay, in order to disciple others, we've got to have it right here first. Okay? So tonight, let's talk about faith and love. These are the last two chapters of uh, the book here. Um, Paul, we know, expounded on what love is. We know it's uh, quite, you know, well from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Ending with the words that the greatest of these is love. Let me read it to you here, starting in verse 4. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man and did away with childish, childish things, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. But now, faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, these scriptures can get twisted up if you take them out of context. Uh, in fact, there's a doctrine called cessation doctrine that says, well, with the last apostles, you know, when everything was, you know, completed from the, the era of Jesus, all of the fruits or the gifts of the Spirit, uh, they all ended and like speaking in tongues and doing all of these things, uh, the healing, that all ended. Well, where did it say that in God's word? Uh, it doesn't. You will not find it, okay? What it's talking about in those verses here that for we know in part prophesy when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When does the perfect come? <laughs> Okay, so when the perfect comes, are we in perfection right now? Don't think so. Okay, we are striving for walking best we can in that kind of a light. Yeah, that's what the Bible tells us to do. Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So we strive towards that. But when the perfect comes, then the partial Okay, it'll be it'll be done away. 
Okay, there won't be need for miracles in heaven. Am I right? Okay, we will be whole. Okay, there won't be the needs for those gifts of the Spirit when the perfect comes. So now, while we are here on this earth, we need to be exercising them. Okay, we got to get an understanding of what the word is saying, understand why people would try to take stuff out of context. It's simply out of their own experience, usually, that you know something didn't happen, uh, maybe I didn't get a healing, that maybe this tragedy happened to me, and well, that just must mean that nothing really works, okay? God doesn't really heal, and God doesn't really do miracles. Well, that's not what the word says. I'm going to go back to the word. I'm going to hold to the word because that I know will stand forever. Faithful is he who has called us and he'll also do it. Amen. All right. Stick with me here. Faith is the fruit of the spirit. Love is a gift of the spirit. Steve writes, understanding this makes love a character development issue, a fruit, while the gift of faith comes as a benefit of grace. Let me do some chapter and versing there for you. Ephesians 3, 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Faith grows when we are aware of his love at work in us, which means that this rooting and grounding and growth of faith in our lives is directly tied to love okay we're talking about love and faith how they mix together all right faith and love are mentioned together as faith and love 53 times in the new testament okay galatians 5 and 6 says this for in christ jesus for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. Okay? In the Amplified Version of that same verse, it reads, but faith activated and energized and expressed and working through love. Get it? Okay? Do you have a desire to walk in more faith I, I do okay faith is activated by love Steve uses the example of using a two-part epoxy chemical both parts remain inert until they are mixed together okay faith and love you've got the epoxy Okay, all you chemical engineers in here, all right. Nothing happens with those two parts, whatever they are, okay? Resident catalyst. Yeah, that's right. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happens just as resin. Nothing happens just as catalyst. catalyst, okay? But when you put those together, boom. Something happens and it reacts. Same thing with faith and love. I like that example here. Thank you, John. Faith is also energized by love. It's like love being faith's battery. Okay? Love is to be the motivator behind any activity of faith. Again, Steve uses a good example of a person opening a present that requires batteries to operate. 
okay? Think back when maybe you've gotten Christmas presents or something and it's a, you know, remote control car or whatever, all right? Cool, 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 but there are no batteries in it. Okay, that's a bummer, okay? You can't do anything with it. Batteries must be present to activate that little remote control car. The same thing, love is like face battery. Until you place the batteries into the gift, it doesn't become animated whatsoever. Faith is expressed by love. An act of faith is only fully understood when it's mixed with love. We may lay hands on someone and a, a healing is manifested, but if love isn't present, it becomes nothing more than an exercise. Okay? Honestly, the, the, you can see this in, you know, many religious circles, okay? It's just almost like a showmanship type thing here. And it, it doesn't, the faith and the love aren't mixing, okay? When we manifest the heart of a loving father, that gift of healing becomes an encounter that is activated in faith. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Laying on his hands, someone gets healed. When that love is activated with that faith, that person starts to feel that presence of an encounter with the Lord and it connects. It actually helps that person to release their faith for that healing. Does that make sense? Okay. There's just some, you know, when you're talking about that, I'm thinking, where's the congregation's part in that one? The minister or others are praying for something, and all of a sudden the whole congregation says, I'm focusing on this. I'm going to turn loose my love right here in the aisle, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to agree. Yeah. Have you seen that happen? Where the whole congregation rises up and it makes a difference. When we're all in one accord, loving that person and turning them loose. Yeah, good point. I mean, you you asked it as a question, but you answered your own question. <laughs> what part does the congregation have? Everything. Uh -huh. Honestly, you know, because here you've got again scripture to back that up. When two or more are gathered in my name. Okay, you can ask anything that you will, and what? It shall be done for them. Okay, we know again, Scripture, two or more gather in my name. I'm in the midst of them. Okay, and these are the things that, yes, it will help to pull together that faith activated in the faith from people that are praying with and agreeing with you, all right, which helps to pull together the love of the Father being poured in to that person receiving it, okay? Amen? Let's keep going. Faith works by love. Love is like a lubricant that minimizes the resistance in people to an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Kind of like that example because this kind of love isn't just for a church setting. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. We're not talking necessarily about these gifts of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit behind it, just being exercised on a Sunday morning. Okay? It's about, it's, it's about your life wherever you're at. It's in the barbershop. Okay? It, it's, it's in the laundromat. It's at the gas station pump. It's at Walmart. Okay? It's wherever you are at. And that's, again, where 
we have to be able to know that the greatest commandment we understand is to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. First Timothy 1 and 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity, which is love, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, which means a sincere faith. Did you catch that? It's a verse, First Timothy 1, 5. The end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart, good conscience, and of faith that's unfeigned, that's sincere. Okay? The faith and love we need is found in Jesus only. 2 Timothy 1 and 13. Hold fast, it says. Retain. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Okay? At the beginning, I, I spoke about grace and about how it creates an environment where the interaction between faith and love takes place. First Timothy 1 and 14, we see this, again, chapter and verse. First Timothy 1, 14, it says, And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant, with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. Okay, Steve writes, when we look at people through the eyes of grace, we will see them through the eyes of faith. When love and faith operate in an environment of grace, heaven begins to invade earth through our lives. I like that. Okay? I'm just going to read that again because it again pretty much puts all of this into a recap for tonight. When we look at people through the eyes of grace, we will see them through the eyes of faith. When love and faith operate in an environment of grace, Heaven begins to invade earth through our lives. <laughs> I love it. Ephesians 6 and 23, it says, Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith and love are never, ever passive. Okay? When they are combined, they create additional benefits or fruits, such as peace. So, how does compassion fit into all of this? Webster's definition of compassion reads like this. It's a sympathetic consciousness of others distress together with a desire to alleviate it. Mm -hmm. The word itself is from a Latin word meaning to suffer with. Okay? More broadly it means to love and to show mercy. Okay? Steve writes, compassion operates as the hands and the feet of love. The fruit of love in our life will be demonstrated by action. The gifts exercised through compassion carry the character traits of the fruit of our loving Father, displaying His goodness to the world all around us. It's pretty simple, really, when we just stop and consider how good he is and what he's given to us to operate in the spirit okay it's like a bridge between the fruit of the spirit love and the exercise of the gifts 
of the Spirit. It's, it's the perfect sound of ministry that resonates from the heart of the Father. John 3, 16, we know it. He gave for God to love the world. That he gave. That's the ultimate act of unconditional love. Am I right? Okay. He describes certain elements of compassion as referenced in Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 and 37. Matthew 9, 36 and 37. It says, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed. They were fainted and dispirited or scattered uh, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Jesus saw the need first. He said, I see the people. They're fainted. They're hungry. Okay? They need something here. But next, it says he felt compassion. Okay? We're talking about compassion again because it's what backs up faith and love. Then Jesus acted by telling his disciples to do something to meet the need. He said, go on, you know, see, find, find some uh, fish, fish and bread. Of course, you know the, the story of five fishes, two loaves, two loaves, five, is that right? Two fishes, five loaves. That's right, okay. The word see here in this verse here, it says that he said he saw seeing the people. That word see in the Greek is edon, E-D-O-N. It means to register. That's more than just a casual glance or a look. Like, oh, I see the car up here. Okay? Jesus seeing the people he could see, he could register, there's something these people need here. Quoting Steve, it says, he said, to see clearly, we will need to address any restriction we might have when it comes to seeing the need and allowing what we see to impact our feelings. Let me explain here. Too often, I think, there's a, a natural reluctance to help someone because of our own busyness. Okay? I, I, I'm, I'm guilty. Okay? You know, I don't have time to, to help you. Okay? I've got this going. I've got this going here. That can, sometimes that's true. Okay? Sometimes history in our own lives causes us to choose to restrict our seeing, which closes our heart to others. We don't want to get overwhelmed with the needs of people around us. The point is, we've got to see through God's eyes through the lens of God's eyes and his heart. Truly, if we're going to help others, okay, and pour out and release into others, we've got to be able to remove some of those restrictions that we impose upon ourselves. A good example of this is found in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Okay, again, we know that parable. But the character, the three characters that uh, we see in that parable, all, you know, we saw the need. Okay? First one that went by was uh, the, uh, the Levite. No, which one was it? The priest. The priest. Okay? First one that went by was the priest. Okay? He saw that there was a person that was laying in the ditch there, all beat, needed some help, okay? Next one that came by was the Levite, okay? Saw, hey, this guy needs some help. 
didn't do anything. Both of them passed by the other side. And then a Samaritan also saw the need. Okay? Luke 10, 33 is where this is coming from. And it says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. You see what happened? A difference. I can see that there's a need here, but then what am I going to do about it? I'm going to take time. I'm going to stop. Didn't really plan on it, but I'm going to because I see something. I, I, I feel it's registering. I want to do this. 1 John 3, 17 and 18 really puts it in our face here of whether or not we are going to love the way Jesus loved here. It says, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. Amen? Amen. Faith works by love. Closing up here. With compassion, we feel compelled to take action to help a person who is suffering. And there is a difference between compassion and sympathy. Okay? Sympathy may see the need and may feel the pain, but compassion has the faith to go beyond where sympathy could ever take us. Okay? That's truly the difference. Matthew 14, 14 says this, when he went ashore, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them. And what was the result? He healed their sick. <laughs> you see it? He saw, he felt compassion, he released, he healed their sick. Love must have action. First John 3 and 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Steve reminds us in this book here that Paul said that his labor was to see Christ formed in us, okay? That means that in every aspect of gift and fruit, gift and character, we become like him. This is the goal of Christian life, is it not? Okay? Doing what he did, behaving like he behaved, and loving like he loved. Steve concludes with this thought. Compassion is not just for the stranger. It provides a vital component of our life together as the body of Christ. Keep listening. Relationships deepen when we love enough to share and identify with the pain, then act to bring the help the relationship needs. I call that family. Okay? I call that loving like a family. Okay? Because that truly is what I see we are maturing into and that we are doing. Okay? Colossians 3 and 13 says this, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. The New American Standard Version <coughs> reads that same verse like this. Just listen again. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
the compassion we operate in will have a close connection with the gift of faith and the release of miracles. I believe that. Okay? I desire that. I want to see signs and wonders following them that believe just like it says in his word here. Philippians 3 and 10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. And just remember that we talked before, if compassion means to suffer with, then this is one of the ways we fellowship with or participate in Christ's sufferings. Okay? Let me read the verse again. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death here. Quoting the last line of Steve's book, if we want to be his hands, we must run after his heart until his compassion becomes our new normal. Amen. 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 Good stuff. I, uh, I, I uh, would encourage every one of you to have this book as a resource in your library. It's an easy read. There's so much in it that, you know, we didn't cover everything, but we covered a lot of the highlights. But I also want to tonight, just to be able to uh, have uh, Dave come up, add his thoughts. Dave, what do you got? <clears throat> Well, can I hear you again? Yeah. yeah. This is uh, this is powerful stuff and elementary, but it takes you all the way. There's no, it's not like there's just this is first grade and then we'll graduate from this. You ain't gonna graduate from this. Now. I'm going to read that last line that he just got done reading. If we want to be his hands, we must run after his heart until his compassion becomes our new normal. Um, does that sound cool? Or does that sound scary? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you what, um, this last week I was up in Pennsylvania at a conference called The Voice of the Apostles. It's uh, put on by Global Awakening, which Steve and Sally are part of. And uh, I really didn't know why I was going up there. I had some hopes to gain some clearer understanding of stuff and be inspired, of course. But um, something happened to me that was uh, a step past a dream that I had had a couple of years ago. I had this dream that I had stepped out of a, like a, a class or a preaching uh, seminar or conference or something. I had stepped outside. It was night. I stepped out on the sidewalk in the open air, and there were still people, all kinds of other people heading out. And all of a sudden, the love of God hit me so strong that I could see everybody with God's compassion, with God's love, and it just tore me up. I started just crying out, wailing for these for their souls, and just just a blubbering, babbling mess falling down on the sidewalk, just screaming, crying out, just making a total fool of myself. And I thought, whoa, that's what the love of God can do to you? I said, I, I, I want that love. I want to be overwhelmed with, with God's love, but I'm afraid of 
him doing that to me. And that never left my mind this thought that what if one of these days he hits me with that? It could be in a Sunday morning. It could be up here. It could be out on the street. I was just, I, I was walking in this like eggshells like I want it, but I'm scared of it. Well, what in us is scared of the love of God? Huh? It's the flesh. Because the love of God is a huge threat to the flesh. The flesh is terrified of the love of God. So if there's anything in me, and I recognize there still is, I'm still scared that God might make a total idiot out of me. <laughs> and just, just ask me to do something that looks absolutely stupid. Because he's going to move through it. I heard testimonies this week of people that, that stepped out doing something that looked like just stupid. And God was in it. And God moved. And miracles happened. I'm inspired by that. I'm challenged. But it scares me. Still. I mean, the love of God is always so nice, always so, so warm and cuddly, the love of God, the love. How did the Father's love present itself? What did the Father do? God the Father, when he loved the world, how ridiculous it is to send your son to die for people that don't even love you, that don't even care about you, that are just going to laugh in your face, spit on you? What sense does that make? But that's our God's love. That's the Father's love. If we really want to be saturated and overwhelmed with His love, you're going to find yourself doing stuff that just doesn't make sense. But I want it. I want it. I'm willing to step out and I feel like already I'm stepping out into a dangerous, if you want to call it, dangerous territory. Just right on the edge of what's going to be. But that's what faith is. Love works by faith. Where does that love come from? Reading books. You can read all the books in the world. That love is not going to get inside here until you get with the one that is love. Until you sit in his presence and just let him saturate you. Until you take on his fragrance. Until his heart just melts in the earth. That's what it's going to take. And I've found that I am treasuring those intimate times with the Lord like I never have before because it's changing me. It's changing me. It's making me like Him. But how exciting! If you see how much somebody, how much God loves somebody, how much are you going to expect him to pour the gifts through you to help them? Isn't it just natural that you would think, well, if I see how much God loves you, I know he's going to do it. He's going to give me a word of knowledge. He's going to give me a gift. Of, he's going to do something so I can give you what he wants to give you. He can be flowing through me. That's what the gifts are all about. They're to help people, deliver people, change people, get them saved, healed, whatever. But it has to flow out of love. Anything else is it's just being cool. Yeah, it's cool to heal people. It's cool to 
pray for people and they get a miracle. It's a lot of fun. But you're taking the risk that you're going to, that same love that wants to pour the gifts through you is going to make you step out and do things that just look totally foolish. And you're not going to get a cool feeling. You're going to get persecution. You're going to get misunderstood. You're going to have people thinking, oh, who's he? Exalting himself. This stuff in here, this man is it's just ring, 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 ringing the bells. It's awesome, God we serve. And we turn him loose. Like I, like I said, I had that dream. I had this kind of a feeling all the time. Ooh, I, I want it, but I'm scared of. Well, this last week I had one of those occasions where, yeah, I was on the floor. My face on the floor, acting like a, like a <clears throat> crazy, crying out, groans that can't be uttered, groans I didn't know I had in me, sounds that I didn't know what I could make. I don't. It didn't matter. It didn't care. It's just the, the love of God flowing. I'm getting less and less scared, but I, you know, the, oh. <laughs> you know, what were the words that preceded that actually launched the greatest fruitful miracle of people getting saved in the New Testament? Think, 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 think. What were the words that were spoken that launched that? <laughs> now let's go a little farther down. Just later. Later. When they, that guy, that guy was lame from his mother's home. And Peter and John came up to him. Look on us! Look on us! Are you willing? Are you ready to step out and, and say, Hey, look at me! Can we live a life where you can look at the others and say, Look at me! I have something! And I know I do! And I can give it! And I will! And then later on, when everybody's looking at them, yeah. Said, Why look ye on us? As though by our own power or holiness we've made this man evil. Oh. You know, there's a there's a time and place for both. Yeah. But the, the boldness you get to be able to say, look on me. Look at my eyes or whatever. Listen. I've got something for you. It comes in that intimate place with God. Yeah, I got inspired by listening to preachers this week. I got inspired, but that wouldn't be enough. Just as an example, I mean, this is one of those things. I, I'm changing my thinking about the look on us part and what's humility and what's pride. And I'm realizing the Lord is telling me that I'm to start speaking out more, being bolder, to say what's in me, what I've got, what I've heard. And I used to think there was things, and there still are, things that are so intimate that you don't share them with others. And I had a lot of those things. This is, just, this is just you and me, Lord. And just not, I'm not going to share this outside. But I tell you what, he's, he's been telling me this week that it's time I can inspire others 
to come in close to him, to draw near to him by sharing the things I'm getting when I draw near. When I draw into his presence. Yeah. This week, uh, normally my routine is I get up in the morning, I spend time with the Lord. Uninterrupted. First thing. This week, of course, I'm at a, at a hotel, going to a conference. Seats are hard to find. Well, they let you save the seats in the morning and then you get to save, when you get there, you get to save that seat for all day. So it really pays. Get there early. If you don't get your seat saved in the morning, you're stuck in the back all day. So I get up my normal time. I go to 7 o'clock-ish. And the thing, doors open at 8. So I'm kind of scrambling. I'm skipping that time with the Lord. Because this is a conference. I'm going to go where the worship is awesome. And the preachers are awesome. And I'm going to get so much from that. And I'm going to hurry and get there. And the first morning, I skipped my time with the Lord. Second morning, I skipped it again. Because, man, I, I want to be up front where, this, where the, the hot and the, the fire is, you know? And, of course, you got to be up 545, get there at 545 in order to get the loose seats. But, um, so the third morning, I just, I just felt like I got out of bed and I said, I don't like this. I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. I don't like this. I don't care if I'm going to be sitting in the bath. Lord, I want, I want this time with you that I'm, I treasure so much. So I decided it was going to be one of those open-ended things. I didn't care if I missed the first session. I was going to take that time with the Lord. I sat down in the chair, put my feet up. I just started worshiping the Lord, just, just loving him, just loving him. The tears were rolling down my face. And I'm thinking about Jesus and his love and what he did for me. And I'm seeing his hands outstretched and the, the prints of the nails. And I just said, Lord, or I said, Jesus, your scars are so beautiful. And just instantly he said back to me, your tears are beautiful to me. They're like jewels. He said, it's like diamonds adorning your face. That's the stuff that will get you bold. That's the stuff that will change you. More than a conference. More than a preacher. More than reading the book. We've got a value that I don't, I don't know what everybody else's practice is. It may be on me. But I'm telling anybody, everybody, that's got to be valued so highly because that's where the love, the compassion gets poured into you when you're just sitting there. Just open, pour it into me. It's just an exchange of, I don't know, <laughs> it's, it's my heart flowing into his and his into mine. And I, I expect to make some mistakes. And that's part of the fear, I think, is that it's the pride that doesn't want to be caught making a mistake. Pride is the opposite of love. Pride is thinking of yourself. Love is thinking of the other. And if you're holding back the love for others, Very likely, it's pride. If you don't want to be overwhelmed, just consumed with the love of God, there's probably pride that's holding it back. So I uh, just said, <laughs> quickly, we all, I mean, I'm examining myself and I, I, I'm not satisfied. More than that, I, I'm distressed with how short with really how little the love of God I've allowed to fill me
برای بردم کنه اون که هم برای این پشه اما که یک جوان خوزده هم اما رو بیرون برد یا که نه I want that love that just blanks out all fear there is no fear in love but the flesh fears love Fire in my bones. 